Hey, how's it going, everyone? Back for another episode of Off the Pitch with myself, Lane Dayton, and my co-host, Daniel Rowley from Leeds United Kingdom. And we'll be talking about all the big games in the Premier League, the disappointing tie between Manchester United and Chelsea. The big win for Manchester City, which takes them 12 points up to the top, and Leeds, Leeds uh, loss against Aston Villa with no Jack Grealish. We'll be talking about all that and even more after... Okay, well, leads to shocking loss to Aston Villa this week. An early goal from El Ghazi in the fourth minute. And Leeds couldn't come back and ended up losing 1-0. Uh, there were some uh, new changes. Diego Loriente was back for his uh, second game, I think, back. I mean, no Jack Grealish for Aston Villa. What do you make of this loss after you guys beat them earlier in the season 4-0? It was an unfortunate loss. I thought Martinez turned up and absolutely played outstanding for them. Um, Villa didn't deserve to win. Leeds didn't deserve to lose. I don't think either team deserved to win. I won't lie. I, I think it should have been a draw. I had a draw written all over it. Um, they got a lucky goal in the start. Um, we came out the second half, but sh stupid place from them. The, as, as a Leeds fan, I, the referee didn't give us anything. Um, target should have been on a red card. He should have had, had about three yellows. He got given one. Um, didn't give another two. There's a couple of uh, shocking decisions. Pablo Hernandez got elbowed in the back of the head and he gets the yellow card for moaning about it. The, the referee was all against his all game, um, as a Leeds fan's point of view. It was an actual, just uh, by unbiased point of view. The referee still, yeah, just didn't give him enough, but um, I don't think Aston Villa did enough to win either. Yeah, I completely agree. And without Jack Ruiz, that Villa team doesn't look the same, obviously. I mean, he's not on the floor like usual. But, I mean, uh, uh, Jack Ruiz creates so much for this Aston Villa team. And you can see Ollie Watkins suffers without him and players around him just aren't the same. And, uh, I mean, watching this from a non-biased perspective, I thought uh, Tyler Roberts played terrible for you guys. I'm not I'm not used to watching you guys week in, week out, but I, I thought he had a shocker first half. I'm not sure what you have to – what do you think of his performance? Because I thought he didn't play too well. He's played better, um, but I didn't think he, he played the most poorly. There was other players on that pitch that didn't play quite good. But I um, – because I, I get sick of hearing from other Leeds fans slagging him off lately. Um, Tyler Roberts is an unbelievable player. You've got to remember, he's only 21. He's a Welsh international. He's not going to be bad. Um, but he's 21 years of age. It's his first season in the Premier League as well. The guy hasn't played a lot. You've got to give him time to settle in. Um, he got an assist in the last game against uh, Southampton. People just aren't giving him enough time. Um, and I'm sick of hearing people, uh, especially Leeds fans, just not giving him enough time. The, the guy is pure quality when he wants to be. Don't get me wrong, when he is bad, you notice it because he's in that central midfield and you're going to notice it. And don't get me wrong, against Aston Villa, he wasn't great, but in taking the turn against Southampton, he was outstanding. Um, it's, he's just take a hit. Yeah, I'm sure. I completely agree. And Aston Villa is just picking up more points here, and they're still in good form. They're moving up the table. They're getting close to that uh, Europa League spot. Do you think they can uh, knock in there and maybe get a Europa League spot or push for Champions League? I think Champions League's too far out, in my opinion. But do you think Europa League's in the, in the pool for them or no? Yeah, you're right with Champions League, it's way too far. Um, I think on a good day, Europa League potentially, um, but I do think there's plenty of better teams than Aston Villa knocking on the door for Europa. Um, there's some other teams that are a lot stronger than them, a lot more consistent that are going to be wanting that Europa spot. I don't think Aston Villa are good enough for it. Um, I, I don't think they're consistent enough, I don't think they're good enough. They've got a good keeper in Martinez that saved them out from a lot of uh, a lot of issues. I think you no, know, take him and Grealish away from that squad, and that squad are, are in a relegation battle. Um, I think they got lucky against us. Um, we left them a few gaps. We played a little bit poorly. Um, second half we came out a bit better, but I think yeah we played a little bit poorly. We left them the chances to get in, and that's why our guys are scored. Um, but I don't think they're good enough without Grealish and I think take my, like I said, take Martinez away and yeah, they're in a relegation battle every day for me. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think uh, Emmy Martinez was a beautiful buy by these owners. I think uh, without him, I think you'd be struggling. We saw it last year without a quality keeper. I mean, you had Pepe Reina, but he's too old. And you bring Emmy Martinez in, you completely change his back line. They're, they're actually keeping clean sheets. They're making some tremendous, tremendous wins. And like with Emmy Martinez, this team is a completely new outfit. And like you said, with Oak Grealish, this team is relegation battle. I mean, they could be low, but I don't know if they'd be that low. I think they'd be 12th, 11th. But uh, Leeds, uh, another uh, loss. I mean, you guys won midweek, but uh, do you think you guys could start winning some or you guys need Phillips back here because it's kind of looking interesting if you can't beat a Gre- uh, Grealish without uh, Villa? No, I mean, Southampton was a good game. We beat them 3-0. Um, we played outstanding. Came out uh, first half was a little bit poor again, which tends to be a Leeds thing. We, we come out a lot better every time in the second half, which we, we beat them 3-0. Good, strong Southampton side. Um, and then, yeah, just unlucky. We're still sort of getting used to a slippy pitch, which I don't think is helping. Um, but like I said, I, I do think the that, that game had a draw written all over it. I don't. Fair enough, they got a good goal, but I, we were robbed of a lot of other chances by the by the referee in my eyes. But I, I don't think Leeds are on a bad bad run of form. I think we we just need to find a sweep. We're still riddled with a few injuries. Um, we've just got Diego Lorente coming. It's only his second game. Robin Cox slowly coming back from injury. Uh, Gaetano Berardi's just played his first game for the under twenty threes today after being out since halfway through the championship season. Um, and we're still missing Rodrigo, Ian Paveda, Calvin Phillips in, in the central defence. We're, we're missing a big hit in injuries, quite a lot of first-team players. Um, and we're still performing. We, we beat Southampton 3-0 with all those injuries. So we've proven that we can fight through it. It's just consistently fighting through it. It's, it's Bielsa balls off days. And, uh, and the other day was where the weekend was one of them. Yeah, I agree. I think you guys are still doing quite well. Like everyone's talking about all these injuries to Leicester, Liverpool. I think everyone's got injuries. I think you got to look at these smaller teams too. Like you guys have injuries. You got to look lower than the table. Every other team's got injuries. Like ah, uh, it's every Leeds team's got to worry about injuries. You guys into, uh, Leeds have the third amount of injuries in the league out of first team players. Most of them are from the team, the squad that we've actually brought in during the transfer window. So Cock, Lorente, Rodrigo, Veda all players that we brought in and they're all being injured. We've got, like I say, the third amount compared to any team, but you're not hearing us moan about it that much. Um, exactly. Hard, every team, but you, you hear a few teams moan about it. Like now Aston Villa have got Grealish out. You know, you're not hearing them stop moaning about Grealish losing. Same with when Liverpool had Van Dijk out, but you're not hearing Leeds moaning. Yeah, we're a little bit upset that Phillips isn't there, but we beat Aston Villa 4-0, 3-0 last time, whatever it was. Without Phillips, so it's like we can't perform without him. He's not, he's a hit, he missed to the team, but he's not, he's, he doesn't have to be there every time we can play without. Yeah, exactly. And you guys, uh, you guys knew you needed some centre backs going into this year, and you picked up two quick ones, Robin Cock and uh, Diego Loriente, and they both got injured for you. I mean, you guys aren't complaining, but you got Liverpool fans every week moaning and complaining that they're down four or five centre backs. But I mean, you guys are still coping okay with it like it's not you got fighting for relegation or anything but you're still doing good yeah. but um moving on from uh, leads and stuff uh we want to talk about var and the big decision in this brighton game here uh Lu- uh lewis dunk took a free kick early free kick and uh referee told him he could take it get ready to shoot the ball on the whistle lewis lewis dunk did it sam johnston wasn't ready it goes in and then the referee blew the whistle right before it went in the net he ends up calling a goal, and then VAR ends up disallowing it because the whistle blew it off right before it went in the net. Do you think this was the right call, or do you think Brighton was wrongfully done here? I do think Brighton was wrongfully done. Uh, for me, referee blows the whistle once, Lewis Dunk kicks it, blows it again while the ball's in the air. That's not fair on the player. The players tried to take a free kick quickly after the whistle's blown. Yeah, the ball's in the air but and the whistle's blown, but there's no reason for it to be. Um, there was nothing stopping that play from being able to go on. Um, for me, it was a poor decision by VAR. As there's been a lot of poor decisions by VAR this weekend, um, and referees in general. Um, but yeah, I do think Brighton were robbed of a very good classy free kick there. Um, but I do think in the whole game itself, Brighton were poor. For professional footballers and Premier League standards, to miss two penalties is embarrassing in my eyes. Um, anyone that's being paid to play football shouldn't be missing the target. Fair enough, the crossbar. Um, 
but the second you know you've hit the crossbar once in a game, you 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 bring it in a little bit. You don't push your limits again. To miss a second penalty is just poor. Brighton should have had the win on that game, and they just didn't capitalize on it. Yeah, Brighton had far more chances. I think. I think they're better than some people are making it out to be. I think. Uh, I mean, I have a soft spot for Danny Welbeck, obviously, obviously an ex United player, but his penalty was great. But he, I mean, he just tucked it too far and hit the post and just went wide and try to swing at it again, you obviously can't shoot it twice off your own penalty. But, I mean, like you said, missing two penalties, you just can't be doing that in the Premier League. And then that free kick, you can't be saying, oh, we lost because it's free kick. I mean, you had two penalties. Like, you got to take your chances. Like, Brighton had so many chances, and they're moaning about this VAR decision. I mean, yes, they did get wrongfully done. But, I mean, you got to look at what they've done throughout the whole game. Like, they made enough chances to win. They just didn't take any of their chances. And in the Premier League, you got to be clinical. And you're seeing Brighton slowly, slowly look down at relegation over their shoulder now and they look like they're going to be safe. And yeah. Fulham started to creep up on them in Newcastle. And I don't know, either one of them could go down, but I could see Brighton going down too. But what, do you think Newcastle or Brighton will go down? I know we talked about this last week, but could you see one of them coming down now with Fulham's recent form? Yeah, no, personally, I still see. I, I think if anyone, Newcastle, Fulham might, might nip over on Newcastle. Um, but I do think Newcastle will find a bit of form with that kind of team. They can be creative when they want to. They've got a good squad. Um, for me, I think they'd tear up the championship if they went down. As long as they could keep the players on financial terms, I think they'd just tear it up and they come straight back up anyway. Um, but I do think they're too good to go down. I think Fulham are that sort of, they're, they're a very good championship side. I don't think they're good enough for the Premiership yet. Um, they can nip a few wins, but anyone, any team can nip a win on the, the day when it comes to it. Um, but I don't think they're consistent enough. I think they will drop off a little bit of form, personally. And I, I, I stand by what I said last week, and I still think it'll be Fulham, West Brom and Sheffield United that'll be getting relegated. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting relegation battle. I mean, I think it's going to be interesting in the title race, obviously, now, because that looks like it's almost wrapped up. But, I mean, moving on from possible championship teams to a possible champion that we've all talked about right after this. Tottenham Hotspurs finally managed to score some goals this weekend against Burnley, winning 4-0. We saw Gareth Bale finally start, which me and you have been saying needs to happen. He starts, he scores two goals, gets an assist. One very nice goal, I have to say. The second, first goal was kind of okay, but he still scored. And you got Lucas Moore on the goal sheet. Spurs had a really good game here, but Burnley have been shocking the past two weeks. And uh, do you think Spurs can crack top four Europa League place? Or what do you make this result for them? No, it's a good result for them. Um... They performed well. I thought they looked like a strong team. Um, Gareth Bale looked back where he is in, in good position. I thought Harry Kane looked as good as ever. Uh, regular, I thought the, the, the assist was good for that goal. I thought they looked like a good, strong team as a whole. Um, how, how are they going to keep it up, though? We know Tottenham aren't the great for consistency. Um, and as we all know, consistency is key in this league. Can Tottenham hold it up? Can they keep it going? On paper, yeah. Every day of the week on paper, Tottenham should be. Um, but I stand by what Roy Keane said at the weekend. Is, is Tottenham take away Harry Kane, um, take away Son, and you've got a very average Premier League team there with Tottenham. Um, and I, I, I stand by what he said. I reckon he's right there, what he says with that. Um, I think they are take away Son and Kane, and I think they are an average team. Son and Kane are keeping that team up. Don't be wrong, we've seen them do, we've had victories without Son and Kane in the past, but I do think that's sort of the, the key for them to stay good. Um, Roy Keane said he doesn't reckon Jose Mourinho actually knows what his starting eleven is. He's had that many different partnerships in defence and in midfield. It, it's hard. Um, but I do think when Tottenham find the feet, they'll, they'll be a challenging force, and I do think they should be a top four team when they find the feet and if they can keep that consistency going. Yeah, I mean, I like what Jose Mourinho did here tactically. He threw in Mora, he threw in Bale, and he played him with uh, Kane and Son, which obviously is going to be a very attacking side when you have those four together. And you're playing a team like Burnley have been awful this week and awful lately. Like, they've been terrible. And we're used to Burnley being able 
hard to break down, hard low block, and that just didn't happen. You saw Josie Mourinho actually tactically go out and break this team down for a very solid attacking lineup. Red Yulon was bombing down that line. I mean, he he went to Spurs over United, which I kind of heard of, but I I prefer Alex Tellez now. But uh, like you said, that's a good Spurs team. But uh, I'll break this down for people here. Jamie Redknapp and uh, – Roy Keane had a harsh argument, got really heated on Sky Sports. Roy Keane took the side of uh, Harry Kane and Son without Tottenham would be average, mediocre, not good. And Jamie Redknapp should stood strong on very – he was very furious that uh, Olderweirel would make this United squad easy. Regulon's one of the best le- – number one left back in the league. Uh, he's, he was saying all the best players in Spurs. He was saying there's some questions over – uh, actually, he said Eric Dyer is a really good defender, which I didn't believe. But um, I want to see where you stand. I know you said you stood uh, with Roy Keane on the Harry Kane Sun issue. Do you stand with Roy Keane on the whole topic, or do you stand with? Are you mixed in the camp, or do you just take any Jamie Redknapp's opinions to heart, or no? Yeah, I'm a mix. I'm a mix. I, I stand by Sergio Regulion's a very good player. Um, I do. I would be surprised if Real Madrid don't buy him back they have got that option in place um yeah but i think for me something jamie redknapp said and he went they're all international team players and roy Keane came back with it doesn't make you a good player because you can play with your international team um it just means you can hold up the ball and i, I think roy Keane was saying put it into perspective who's actually out of there is going to make man city or um, who's going to make chelsea who's going to make man united who's going to make liverpool and i don't think a lot of them would um, if you want to put it into perspective, have a look at how many Leeds players actually play for um, how the, for the country. Mateusz Klick, Gianni Alioski, uh, Tyler Roberts is a country player. Um, we used to have a few more. And I know we have got a few more. Stuart Dallas. Uh, put that into perspective. I'm not being funny. I love all those players with my heart. But are they really going to make the Man City squad? You wouldn't see any of them in a Man City squad. But this, but they're the international players. So does that instantly make them the best players in the league? Is that what Jamie Redknapp's saying? No, I I'd be backing Roy Keane on this one. Um, I do I do agree. Roy Keane's put a few more players out there. Um, I do think Endon Bellé's showed a bit of class lately, and I do think he he likes a regular on a, a very good. But I I don't think with Jamie Redknapp, I, you you can't say uh, they're all international players. That means they're really good players. Gianni Alioski, no offense to him, I absolutely love the guy a bit. But he plays for Macedonia. It's the first time they've recently got into a European. I think it's the first time ever they've just got into the Euros. So it's like you can't compare a Macedonian to. to oh no, that sounds a little bit racist. I don't mean it like that. But you, you can't compare you likes so just because they're international players means they're amazing. You, you can't. It, it does mean they're good. It does mean they've got a bit of class about them. But there's there's levels there's levels in there. Uh, but yeah, Roy Keane on this one all the way for me. Yeah, same with me here. I mean, uh, you had Redknapp pretty uh, furious that Alderweireld would make his make Roy Keane's Man United team. I thought that was a complete joke. Alderweireld's slower than Maguire and even slower than Lindelof. Like, if you're slower than Maguire, you got problems, man. Like, we need a fast center back besides them, and you can't put Alderweireld beside them. I guess he has experience, but no. Like, uh, Red Redknapp had a lot of problems with his argument. He he was he was really heated, but I thought it was quite entertaining. It was funny to see. I mean. Oh, the, the comments uh, Redknapp was coming out after Roy Keane, it was just funny to laugh at because Roy Keane had him beat all day. Every, he just kept winding him up. It was so funny. But um, I want to say, uh, do you think Spurs are back on form with this victory? Do you think they can push on for more? Or do you think this is uh, their ceiling? Do you think they're going to make Europa League? Or do you think the two Merseyside teams are going to keep them out? I, I think they should be making Europa. The team they've got should be pushing Europa again. Um on talks of form, though, they need to beat a top six team. Then they can talk about gaining a bit of form. In, uh, in recent, they haven't beat beaten anyone of a name. Don't get me wrong, you, you'd expect them to beat Burnley every week. You'd expect them to beat Leeds every week. You'd expect them to beat any team in the bottom half of that table. Um, it's They need to be challenging the top half of that table a little bit more for me. Prove that I can beat them teams. I'm inconsistent to beat them teams. And then we could be talking about how well they're going to do. I just, like I've said to you before, there's something about Spurs. Always said it. The, the squad they've got should be challenging more. Um, and like I said, they are a very average squad apart from a couple of players. But you put them players in, it does make them a good squad. 
Um, they, they do play well together on the day, and it just baffles me how they're not consistent in, in results. They're never consistent in results. The, they'll get a 4-0 four win, uh, four win this weekend, and then they'll probably go 4-0 down in another week, and it's there's just no consistency with them at all. Yeah, I agree. You never get any consistency out of this Jose Mourinho Spurs side, and a 4-0 win is pretty good for them, and Hopefully they can move on. We'll see if they can get anywhere. I like Son. He's a good player. And Bale, we'll see if he can finally get a run of games because he finally got a start. And hopefully he's on the bench next week where he usually ends up after he gets a start. And he ends up back where he usually is and smiling on the bench like Gary Neville says. But uh, moving on to another big game this weekend, Liverpool played Sheffield United. At halftime, we saw it be 0-0. Klopp made some new tactical moves. He put in uh, – not Nate Phillips, since uh, obviously Jordan Henderson went out with a six to eight week injury, and you saw him play beside Quebec, and they played with their wing backs a bit more on the wing like they're used to. But it was a two 0 victory for Liverpool in the end. They came out in the second half scoring two goals. I'm sure Klopp was quite furious going into halftime nil nil against Sheffield United. Uh, what do you make of this performance from Liverpool? Do you think they can move on from here? Um, in an honest opinion, I don't think Liverpool were good enough. Um, I thought Sheffield were kept alive by uh, by the goalkeeper. I thought the goalkeeper had an outstanding game. Um, some incredible saves from Ramsdale, absolutely incredible saves, and he kept the game alive for Sheffield. The the two goals, watching them back, they literally scored because Sheffield's defence was absolutely appalling. Um, one of them came off a deflection, which went over the keeper, and the other one um, was just poor, poor defending. Um, genuinely, I, I think Liverpool didn't look good enough, though. With, with the defence Sheffield's got, they should have been pushing that net. Um, Firmino missed an absolutely awful shot. Um, he was one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. You, you, you'd have put money on him to have scored that any other day in Ramsdale. In fairness to Ramsdale, made an incre incredible save, but Firmino should have done so much better. Um, there was another couple of times where uh, Firmino, again, rather than going for a shot, went for a little back pass into no one. It's, it's just unfortunate for Liverpool. Sheffield have got an awful back line. I think if it wasn't for that, you put them up against a team with a back line that day and that's a different result there. It's, it's either nil-nil or the votes going against the other team. If they'd have played like that against Leeds, Leeds would have capitalised on them there in my eyes and we, we would have been pushing them. Um, yeah. They wouldn't have got a point against us that day playing like that. Um, I think any team that's got any half-decent defence and can keep some composure, they, they wouldn't have got a point from that game. Um, but in terms of it being a win in itself, is that enough just to give Liverpool the boost? Is it the boost that they needed just to hear the words, you've got a win? Um, can they go on from that and now just have a little bit more get up and go for the team and perform a little bit better now that they've just got that win behind the back? Or are they just going to continue with the same form and realise another team's not going to let them have it in that easy and another team's going to send them back packing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they finally broke that uh, four-game four, four game snap losing streak in 2021. I think it was much needed for them because now it's finally got that much-needed win, but they got to go home and win at home, keep up the form now because winning Sheffield, like Roy Keane said, it's you're beating Sheffield. Like it's it, You should be expecting to beat Sheffield. I mean, yes, they got low confidence, but they always should be expected to go out there, beat Sheffield, move on next game but like with the form that they're in the confidence they're in i guess yeah you're going to struggle against sheffield i guess but it should be just go out there win everyday job go out there get done yeah. with but uh for a team that has low confidence it just makes sense but like you said ramsdale he had a good game uh everyone's been criticizing for them and I think Ramsdale is obviously a step down from where Dean Henderson was and uh, I think Ramsdale was a bargain for what they got him for and I think he was well worth the price it's just their back line is too shaky for me I think they, they need to reinforce that back line in order for Ramsdale to have better games mm. um, I don't know I, this, this Sheffield team is obviously going down I hate to see it because they've had a good last year but I thought it was great to see Liverpool. I mean, I'm a United fan, but I think it was great to see uh, Liverpool finally score, uh, win when Mo Salah isn't scoring. I think it was. Very, it's been very rare to see them win when he hasn't scored. You saw Curtis Jones and then another great goal. And I think uh, I like Curtis Jones. He deserved his goal. He's been playing great. I love how we dedicated it to Allison. I think that was a great little touch he did there. But 
Yeah, I don't know. Can, can you see this team uh, making top four, or is this back line a bit too shaky for you? Because I think it's going to be tough for them now. No, I still think Liverpool are nowhere near top four. I think, I think they'll be pushing Europa this year, personally. They'll be lucky. They'll be extremely lucky to get top four. They'd have to get all the results their way, um, which I don't think is going to happen. I think, they, I think they'll be looking at, uh, at Europa League. And they should be looking at that because if they're not getting Europa League, then they really have got to worry on their hands. Because um, Sheffield United looked fairly decent against them yesterday, apart from in that defence. I think that's the only thing that left Sheffield down. I think if, if that defence had been better and they didn't have to purely rely on Ramsdale, I think they could have actually got a result against them. Um, and I think that's that's the thing Sheffield have got to focus on going forward. They're going to get relegated next season, this season. Um, and I think for them to come back, they have to get that defence better. And I think we could see them back in the Premier League in two years' time, potentially, if they can just get that defence sorted out. Because they're not a poor, poor team going forward. They just, just lack a bit of everything, really. Um, they, they just need to get the stuff going for them. Yeah, for sure. And um, uh, we'll be moving on from a team that's a possible top four team to two teams who are currently in the top four, taking up those plays from Liverpool right after this. The big talking point in the big game of the weekend, Manchester United versus Chelsea. It was 0-0, a boring draw. I mean, Ole made some tactical adjustments. He brought on Lindelof to, to solidate the back line instead of Bailly midweek. Bailly must have been tired, but I think it was a poor decision tactically because then the team couldn't push up and press Chelsea as much. And then he also brought in Fred McTominay, very defensive too. And Dan James trying to hit them on the counter. But Dial James had a great game for what he was dealt with for the ball. He didn't touch it much, but uh, this Chelsea side looks like they're just playing not to concede under Tuchel. They don't create much at all, and they don't allow anything. Um, I mean, this is obviously from a, a bit of a biased perspective as a United fan myself. What do you think from coming from a Leeds fan? Yeah, honestly? I thought the game was, honestly, I thought it was boring to watch it. I did unfortunately watch it, and honestly, I was almost clawing my eyes out then uh, just to stay awake. Um, I thought the way Man United sort of came out, it looked like they've accepted second place in the league now. Um, it doesn't look like they wanted to challenge. If a team in second place, for me, should should have come out fighting, at least tried to have put a bit more pressure on Chelsea. Um, don't get me wrong, I thought both teams looked very good defensively um, in, in that aspect, but I just thought it was, it was a game for looking at chances created and looking for a bit of action. It's one of the most boring games I've watched in a while. Um, just not a lot going for it. Um, I don't think Chelsea came out fighting enough either, I won't lie. Um, but I do think United's back line, so I kept them in control and did well there. Um, but yeah, for me, United should have come out fighting so much more. Um, I do think they, the way they looked is just they've accepted second place in this season and they'll, they'll build on that hopefully from next season. We might see a bit more from them and hopefully we might see them challenge a few sort of weaker sides in the league. Um, but yeah, a game like Man United-Chelsea, it has everything written on it for what should be quite an exciting game, and we just didn't, didn't. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, and uh, I think this game was really disappointing. Yeah, you had a lot of fans who will say he's tactically, tactically vulnerable, and this game really showed it. I, I think sadly, I think he could. This is a game he really could have went on, pressured Chelsea, got on the front foot, scored a goal. Then he could have sat back, in my opinion. Yes, if he wants to sat back. At least try to get a goal. We didn't really try at all. Our only chance came from a penalty shot and McTominay in like the 90th minute, 89th minute, when he scuffed his pass, which should have been easily a goal, I said to you. But, um, yeah, all he set up poorly, I think, in my opinion. He just didn't want to go for it. He didn't play by you, which slowed down the team. We couldn't press. 
He played McTominay and Fred and told McTominay to stay back, as we've seen lately in the past couple months. If you play McTominay in that midfield and rover role, he's good to go forward. He's good to move around in the field. He did it against Leeds when he had room to run. He could play on his own. He scored a couple nice goals against you guys. He's done it against Arsenal once or twice. He's, he's played tremendous in games with Tomine when he's given the freedom to roam around. And when he plays besides Fred and he has to cover Maguire and Lindelof, who are so slow, it's embarrassing. But you got – but. They, they're just the workhorses, Fred and McTominay. They're just covering for McGuire and Fred and sweeping up the mess that they leave behind every time, and it gets annoying. But, yes, Ole set these up, this team up to get a point. Same with Tuchel. I think this, I think uh, Tuchel's Chelsea side needs to get creative. They created maybe one chance against us in a header that Giroud missed, and that was about it. I mean, yes, our defense was great. But they didn't really give us much to defend, really. I mean, that's how I was for them. Their, their, their back line was good. They're obviously going to defend. But we really didn't give them much to defend either. Uh, there was obviously another big penalty show because they always did it every weekend now in the Premier League. Uh, there was a, that handball show on Calum hudson Adoy. I mean, everyone could be saying I'm biased here and be saying it shouldn't be a penalty. It shouldn't be a penalty for a slight touch in the hand. But you're a Leeds fan. What do you think of that call? Do you think it should have been given? Yeah, as a team that hates both Man United and Chelsea, there was a penalty all day. Um, end of the day, yeah, the bar, we, we saw a penalty given in Brighton's game for a hand in, on a shoulder, which I thought was a bit harsh. But this one was a hand away from the body. It's tapped his hand. It's a penalty all day long. I know the Chelsea fans will be shouting, well, it tapped his hand and then it hit um, Greenwood's. Well, yeah, it's hit Greenwood's hand because it's come off his hand. Um, no, I'm sorry. Referee made a really poor decision that game, especially how I, I overheard. Uh, apparently, VAR told him to give the penalty and he decided not to. Um, and there's rumours uh, Luke Shaw came out after the game and said he overheard the referee say to Harry Maguire that it had been too controversial had he have given the penalty. Um, if that's Whether that's true or not, we know players can make up stuff just to try and cause a bit of a fuss. Um, if it is true, it's appalling from the referee. Absolutely appalling. Um, I thought the decision itself was appalling. I knew it's not. The referee was in perfect eye line of it. It should have been a penalty all day long. Um, fair enough if the ball had been away from his arm, it laid down by his arms, but it wasn't. It was away from his body. At the end of the day, if you touch the ball with your arm when it's away from your body in the box, we all know what go, which way it goes. Uh, but no, the referee really made, uh, made a really poor decision for me. Um, yeah, like we've said the past couple of weeks. Oh. Yeah, yeah, like we said the past couple of weeks, it's been so inconsistent, and uh, like this, this is getting cold every for most teams, but then it doesn't get cold for some teams. I don't know, it's a, it's a joke, but like, like you said about Luke Shaw, I think I think that's embarrassing if that is true, because yeah. like, how, how can you how can you have VAR go back a minute later, tell him it's a penalty? He goes and watches for a couple minutes, and then he comes back, and Maguire is furious that it doesn't get called. And he tells H that, yeah, we didn't call it because it'd be too controversial. Like, really, like you gotta, you gotta make everything consistent here. Like, it's it's the Premier League, the biggest league in the world. And if Luke Shaw is really telling the truth here and he's not trying to cause a fuss, then that's just, it's a, it's a joke. And you had Ole Gunnar Solskjaer saying right after him that he 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 doesn't want to comment because then it'll be in trouble. Like, I don't, I, it's it's VAR is becoming a joke in my opinion. I know it yeah. needs to work. No, I, I think I think for me, referees on. They aren't confident enough at the minute. They, they, they don't have enough about them. They're, they're too scared to make decisions. Um, and I, I also I get sick of them. You, you see a lot in games where they're not blowing a whistle until the player shouts for something. They're not making their minds up for themselves. Um, but I think it's out of order some of the way the players are going up to them, even when, fair enough, like, it, okay, so the referee hasn't made the decision. No player should have to go up and speak to him there. It should be a back off, no go zone. Same with before Chelsea players. You could see it in the camera. Chelsea players were stood right behind his back as he's witnessing that. The linesman's telling him to go away, and they're just not listening. There's not enough authority in referees at the minute. They're not brave enough to make these decisions. As a as a rugby league man, if you are even rugby union, as a referee, you don't go and approach that referee. Only the captain goes and approaches him, and you speak in a civilized manner. The second you start getting cocky to a referee or start running your mouth to it, you'll get what we call simbin in rugby league, where it'd be a yellow card and you spend 15 minutes off the pitch. You don't you don't talk back to referees, and I think in football lately it is disgusting the way players feel it's 
acceptable to to shout and swear at referees like they do um and i don't think it's on um you shouldn't be behind the referee's back as he's looking at the video ref um and for me like i've said the video ref isn't it's not good enough there's, there's so many improvements that can be made and i know half the pundits will say it on sky sports on a weekly as well um but referees need to get more confident in making decisions if like i said if he truly has turned around to harry Maguire and said i didn't make it because it was controversial it's embarrassing it's an absolute disgrace um and referees need to sort of give themselves a shake pick themselves up as a whole and sort of sort some out because it's just a joke lately yeah I we'll move on to the blue side of manchester to manchester city who beat west ham 2-1 it was a great great win for manchester city i mean they had most of their stars on their bench and sadly they were which is pretty embarrassing, but uh, there's so much firepower I chose. I think that uh, north of 500 million on the bend, which is unbelievable. And uh, you had Stone scoring a really nice goal, cut back. It was a great finish for a center back in the box. And you had Ruben, they big goal from that. What are you doing? Yeah, I thought Man City were outstanding again. Um, like you say, to have that many players on the bench that are your first team players and to not even need them is, is, is unreal. Good. Um, I, I thought, thought Man City were just, just top notch. Um, you never had a doubt when they went 1 1. That Man City weren't going to come back. Uh, for me, the assist from Kevin De Bruyne was absolutely outstanding. Um, but for two defenders to have finishes like that, just top notch. And it shows Man City can they, they can take off Aguero, they can take off Jesus up front, and they can leave the defenders to score the goals. They can do they can play however they want. But I think Man City have run away with it, like I've said for a while. I don't think West Ham look bad as well, though. Um, I've got to admit, I don't think West Ham look too poor. Um, the Antonio goal that came off Jesse Lingard for the assist once again Lingard's been performing I thought Antonio fair play goal for him um, I didn't think the goals have been bad from West Ham I think they've still been looking pretty good um, but uh, you just at the minute City that's 20 wins in a row for them 20 consecutive wins to be doing that is just extraordinary um, like I said to you the other week Lane I'm, I'm not looking forward to when it comes around and Leeds have to play him again it's, it's going to be a rough one, but all credits to where City, where it's due, it's, they're, they're outstanding at the minute, they're on form and they, they're not stopping for anyone. You say Manchester City have looked great lately, I mean, it's like we play them next week and I'm off, honestly terrified, like all he's obviously going to set up in this low block, the boring's nil-nil again like we just saw against Chelsea, it's going to be 0-0 unless City can score like usual like they've been doing lately. I'd hate to see it be 21 against us because... Obviously, it's United and City. It's a huge rivalry. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable what City are doing here with the team they have. No striker and Aguero. Kevin De Bruyne has been injured for so long. They're not scoring so many goals. They're just defending unbelievably. Like, this is the best football I've seen since since uh, Guardiola's Barca side. I'm honestly scared for United's treble winning 99 side because you got the City could honestly win the quadruple. They're in the final League Cup. They're still in the FA Cup. They got Champions League, which are looking tremendous. They've obviously got the Premier League locked down now. But let's move on from City because they're going to win everything, sadly. But West Ham, I want to talk about West Ham. They've, they've, they've been a solid team all year. David Moyes is doing a great job. He has them top four right now. Do you think they can hold that fourth spot or even stay up there or get Europa League at least with this team and how good they're playing lately? Yeah, I think if they can keep the form they're on, I think the Champions League would be it'd be good for them. I think you're pushing it, but I do think Europa League they should be making this year. I think they've looked good. Um, I think, they, I think they, yeah, definitely Europa League spot. It just depends if the teams that are just behind them can manage to nip that spot off them. And as long as West Ham can keep this little bit of form they're on, keep the consistency going. Um, I think if they drop off in form, it could be game over for them, and they could just end up mid table again. There's still a long way in this league to go. Um, they, but I think if they keep them out of the plane at the minute, for the squad they've got, they're doing outstanding. You wouldn't have put them in fourth at any point in the season. 
um, looking on how it was going to do. So I think credit credit to David Moyes and what he's doing. The, I think Antonio's looking good. Jesse Lingard's been outstanding since he joined. Um, they're, they're all looking real good and they're looking like a challenge inside. Yeah, for sure. This West Ham team could... I mean, I hope they get Champions League spot. I mean, it's really unrealistic. I think they'll get Europa League spot with how consistent they've been and how shocking the teams below them have been that are challenging with them. But I want to touch on one player that you talked about for West Ham, Mikel Antonio, before we wrap up here. He's uh, talking about joining Jamaica, and Jamaican Federation of Football is trying to convince him to join the Jamaican national team so that he can uh, play in the CONCACAF division and try to make the World Cup. For me as a Canadian fan, it's obviously scary because then you have Leon Bailey from Leverkusen and Decker Doble reed from Fulham with Antonio, which would be absolutely probably the best attack in CONCACAF, which is kind of sad, but it's kind of scary because it's such a good front three. But that would shock a lot of teams in CONCACAF region, even U.S., because they don't have a good back line. And Canada's isn't great. As, as an England fan yourself, do you think Antonio could still make this England team or do you think he should go play for Jamaica and try to make the World Cup with this team? I, I genuinely I prefer to see him make Jamaica. Um, for his own benefit, I think there's less competition there. Um, he'd make the he'd make the team with ease. Um, I think for the minute England, the the forwards is one of the hardest positions you've got to fill at the minute. We we spoke up, we touched on it the other week. You got Harry Kane at the minute. You got Danny Ings, Jamie Vardy's still up there. Calvert Lewin, Patrick Bamford's getting spotted at the minute. There's so many England front forwards that are pushing for that England spot. I think Mikel Antonio, I think he's been good. I'm not going to lie, I would pick Bamford over him. A little bit of bias as a Leeds fan, but as, a, as an honest opinion, I think Bamford plays a better role up at that front, um, as long as he's played right. And this is what we saw with Southgate before. Is he, he brought Phillips into the, the, uh, the England squad and he didn't play Phillips in his correct position and Phillips looked completely out of it. Um, and that's nothing to do with Phillips, it's all Southgate, and I don't think Southgate's the best England manager, in all fairness, but less of that, and we'll talk about Antonio, but yeah, I do think Jamaica's the squad for him, I think he'll look good, I think they'll win a little bit more at Jamaica, um, with the, the trophies that side of the uh, the Atlantic, I think go for it, I think he'll, I think he'll be a good, strong, strong addition to that squad, and I think he'll make it with ease. That hurts because I'd hate to see him join Jamaica as a Canadian. But, I mean, I think it'd be great for him. I think this Jamaica team could push. It's This is obviously Canada's toughest competition right now because you've got Mexico and U.S. who obviously make it every year. And it's right now it's Canada, Jamaica, and Costa Rica. And I think it'd be more likely Jamaica if he joins that team because it's going to be a heck of a front three. Yeah. And it's going to be fast. But I think I think Canada could could keep up with Davies and some other players that we have and Jonathan David, who scores some goals up front. You know, obviously the CONCACAF is not the strongest division by far. And Antonio could see the most goals he's probably ever seen in his career coming from international football that way. I mean, yeah, it's it's a dodgy division, the CONCACAF. You, you don't have too many good teams. To yeah. Three or four quality teams, it's about it. No, I it's, do it's think not a player like Antonio will do well over there. I do think a player like Antonio, oh, he, he, the, the defences he's up against, uh, for a player like him, he should be coming in easy. And, and that's what I mean. I do think for, for his own benefit to go over there, I think he'd be so much better and improve his career, improve his confidence. No, no offence, but the, the back lines he's got to get through over that side, they're, they're not, they're not going to be too hard. Mexico, America, Canada, apart from Davies, I, I couldn't even name you another defender out of all of them. Yeah, I think he's he's got an easy job there. I think he'll he'll do well. He'll bang a lot of goals in, like you say. He'll probably score quite a lot as if he goes over there with his career goals. I think he'll look good. Yeah, it'll be a nice boost his confidence for West Ham and for his stats. Just no personal record and boosts like it boosts his confidence. To hope my West Ham, but like you said, the defenses aren't great. Mexico is pretty good. You got even US. They're terrible back line. I, you see, I saw Sergino Dest for Barcelona there. He got absolutely torn to shreds against Paris Saint-Germain. At least, at least Davies can keep up with them. I mean, as a Canadian, I have to say that. But uh, Canada, Canada's back line isn't great at all. We picked up the Portuguese international about a month ago. The rest of the back line is pretty shocking. And then, like you said, some of the countries aren't great. You're playing, like, the Virgin Islands. You're playing Carousel. Like, it, it's – D'Antonio would have a heyday. He'd be scoring three or four hat-tricks almost every week, this guy. But – 
I mean, he's a quality player. I mean, I, I'd love to see him just for the great for the game of Concacaf to see another quality player join the division. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be great to see him week, week in week out. It is international football because I think he's a quality player. I hate to see it for Can- Canadian perspective, but for his perspective, I'd love to see him come over to Concacaf, and and hopefully we can see him sometime soon. We're going to wrap it up here for our uh, third episode of Off a Pitch. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us this episode and last episode as well. It was a great episode talking about the Premier League, uh, obviously the shocking VAR decisions, United's terrible draw, and City running away with the title once again. I'd like to say thank you to everybody from myself and my co-host Daniel, and we'll see you next week for another episode.